Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you're tuned in from. I welcome you this day to this webinar on geothermal district heating and cooling, an event that is co-organized by IRENA in conjunction with the European Geothermal Energy Council, ALBOG, uh, uh, EJEC. Uh, this event is uh, being uh, done in the framework of the International uh, uh, Conference on Smart Energy Systems, an, an event that is uh, held every year by Alborg University uh, to promote um, district heating and, and other uh, infrastructure for renewables uh, energy. My name is Jack Kiruja, and I'm an Associate Program Officer for Geothermal Energy at IRENA, where I support the agency's geothermal-related work undertaken in the framework of the Global Geothermal Alliance. So before we begin, I will briefly take you through some housekeeping uh, points uh, for this event. Um, uh, so um, all the participants have been muted by the organizers, but in case you need to ask a question, you can raise your hand using the raise hand icon, or you can type in your question or comment on the chat box. Then at the end of this uh, webinar, uh, which is being recorded, uh, the, record is, the recording is going to be made available on the IRENA website. Um, so um, uh, at this moment, I, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Goodwood Gonul, the Director for Country Engagement at IRENA, to provide his opening remarks. Mr. Gonul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jack. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this event on geothermal district heating and cooling, which aims to offer a um, um, platform for exchange on the promotion of viable solutions relying on the direct use of geothermal heat, mainly in the building sector. Today's event is um, organized under the umbrella of the Global Geothermal Alliance, um, which offers an, uh, a global platform for enhancing dialogue, cooperation, and coordinated action among all geothermal stakeholders in fostering geothermal development globally. And my special thanks to the uh, European uh, Geothermal Energy Council, EJEC, for supporting IRENA in conceptualizing and co-organizing uh, this event. I am pleased to see increasing number of stakeholders working together uh, to promote towards an increased contribution of geothermal energy in the decarbonization of energy systems, including in the heating and cooling sector. Indeed, um, infrastructure such as district energy systems, as well as the development of the risking instruments will play a critical role in supporting the increased uptake of geothermal energy. Here, let me refer to an interesting figure from our recently released World Energy Transition Outlook, which offers a global energy transition pathway aligned with 1.5 degree objective of the Paris Climate Agreement. The outlook highlights the need to increase the renewable share in district energy systems to 90% by 2050 from 9% in, uh, back in uh, 2018, which is quite a significant um, uh, number, but in our view, that's totally achievable if conducive investment environments are created. Earlier this year, <clears throat> together with the Alborg University, uh, we have published a guidebook for policymakers on integrating low temperature renewable energy sources in district heating systems, district energy systems. The guidebook presents uh, a number of tools and options that policymakers can consider with a view to facilitating an increased deployment of renewable heat uh, resources, including geothermal, for heating and cooling in buildings and domestic water supply. Geothermal energy has a critical role to play in achieving this milestone. For example, studies in Europe indicate that close to 25% of EU's population live in areas that can be heated directly using geothermal energy. And geothermal resources are widely available, particularly low and medium temperature resources that are very suitable for heating and cooling and other direct use applications. But concerted efforts by governments, financiers, um, industry and academia are required to realize its full potential. In this regard, IRENA has already 
uh, started working with governments and local administrations in resource-rich uh, countries to demonstrate the potential for establishing renewable-based uh, district heating systems and to develop strategic heating and cooling plants. In doing so, we will position geothermal energy as well as other locally available renewables such as solar thermal and sustainable waste heat in the energy transition conversation and in the energy plans uh, for uh, governments and uh, local uh, administrations authorities. We already had workshops in Belarus and, and China in the past months the, uh, to help policymakers take informed decisions in this, in this regard. We invite interested cities and partners to join hands with IRENA under the Global Geothermal Alliance umbrella in the development and implementation of such heating and cooling plants. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to reiterate the importance of continuously exploring ways and means to support the increased deployment of renewables in energy systems. Supportive tools and methodologies are essential, while capacity building and exchange of experiences and best practices will continue to play a pivotal role. Centralized infrastructure must be put in place to support the distributed supply of energy from different renewable resources for heating and cooling. And this infrastructure should be designed, taking into consideration the perspective of the overall energy system uh, design and its uh, ability to adapt uh, uh, to the ever-changing needs. Risk mitigation instruments are key in attracting the much needed investment in renewable energy development, particularly in the geothermal sector. These and other measures uh, will contribute immensely to putting geothermal at the forefront of energy transition for a stronger action on sustainable development and climate change. With that, um, I thank you all uh, and look forward to fruitful discussions today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunul, for those insightful remarks. So uh, next, um, we're going to, the, to go to the next part of the agenda where we are going to be listening to uh, some presentations uh, from our panelists for today. So I'm going to provide an introductory, um, um, uh, some introductory, inter introductory uh, presentation. And this will be followed by a presentation on GeoRisk by Philip Duma from EJEC. And then we're going to have a, a presentation on energy transition in the Netherlands from Hans Bolscher, as well as the clean heating uh, in cities um, with some lessons from China to be done by uh, Hakur uh, Harderson. So uh, we were expecting to have uh, Brian from uh, Alborg University uh, with us today, but um, he could not be able to make uh, due to some last minute um, 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 issues that came up. So um, these are the uh, people who are going to be making the presentations um, during the next session. And uh, to begin us off, I will um, give this introductory uh, presentation. Uh, which will be focusing on the uh, integration of renewables in district heating and cooling systems. So first, um, let's look at the status of the heating and cooling sector, uh, whereby we see that um, about 65% uh, uh, of the energy uh, that is produced today is consumed in the cities. Uh, and these are, um, the cities are also responsible for about 70% of the carbon emissions uh, that are being released today. Again, uh, in the cities today, we see that about 55% of the world population reside there. And it's projected that by 2050, uh, close to uh, two thirds of the population will have moved to the cities. Of course, this means that the demand for uh, energy in the cities is going to uh, keep increasing. Now, another thing to note about this energy is that about 50% uh, of all the energy that's produced today is um, uh, utilized for heating and cooling applications. And for the heating and cooling applications, a space heating, hot water, uh, space cooling um, contribute about 32% of, uh, of the heat, which means that this are, is a sector that uh, uh, is consuming a quite a big chunk of the energy that's produced. Now, um, unfortunately, most of this energy is produced uh, through um, the burning of fossil fuels, of course, leading to heavy emissions in some places, as well as uh, pollution. Um, the other thing to note is that most of the heating and cooling uh, systems that are in place today 
are based on standalone uh, units. Uh, and these units, of course, the, their uh, mode of operation is not the most efficient um, for today. And uh, because of these uh, factors, then it's very important that we start thinking up about uh, transitioning to the use of renewables to avoid uh, some of these uh, 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 challenges. And another thing is that renewables are can be able to contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Uh, for example, um, uh, giving uh, good health um, due to living in cities with less pollution. Uh, also ensuring access to clean and affordable energy through the use of renewables for heating and cooling. And also um, it can con uh, the use of renewables are definitely going to contribute to climate action uh, through um, decarbonization of energy systems and particularly the heating and cooling sector among other uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, when you talk about the renewables, then there are a number of them that uh, we, can, we can consider to use in the district and heating, um, uh, district heating and cooling uh, systems. And these include um, the use of solar thermal, uh, whereby the uh, energy from the sun can be harnessed using the different technologies that are available in the market today and used to supply heating or cooling to the uh, buildings or, I mean, to our homes or to our offices. We can also consider uh, to use um, a waste heat uh, from cooling operations. And here we are referring to sustainable heating, um, sustainable waste heat that can be obtained from, for example, uh, cooling operations in the data centers, as well as um, from the cooling of uh, some uh, industrial thermal processes. Uh, we can also uh, get the energy uh, from water, water sources, uh, particularly for um, uh, cooling of, uh, of houses, as well as for providing heating. Finally, we can also consider geothermal as another source for um, providing the energy for heating and cooling. Now, one thing with these uh, renewable energy resources, most of them is that they occur at low temperature, uh, which uh, presents a challenge to the utilization. And the only um, most efficient way of uh, utilizing them is through the use of district heating and cooling infrastructure. Now let's look uh, more specifically at geothermal options for heating and, uh, and cooling. So we have the deep and shallow geothermal resources, uh, which can be tapped by, by drilling into the ground at various depths to access the resource. And examples of these can be found in Iceland where they're using the high temperature resources and the Netherlands and China, where they're using the low and medium temperature geothermal resources for heating and cooling. We can also get um, uh, geothermal resources uh, for heating and cooling from abandoned coal mines. And examples of this can be found in Spain, as well as in the Netherlands, among other places. And uh, then uh, the, the, the ultra temperature, uh, ultra low temperature geothermal resources, like in the, in the Paris Sackley um, uh, project, whereby um, geothermal resources as low as 30 degrees are being used for heating and cooling through the use of heat, uh, heat pumps. And they can also be obtained through a co-production from oil and gas wells. Um, now, when you talk about um, using this to heating and cooling to enable the, the utilization of these resources, we also know that the district heating systems have been evolving over time, uh, starting with the um, first generation district heating and cooling systems. And these were characterized by high um, inlet and outlet temperatures, as well as low um, thermal efficiency. But over the years, um, the technology of these district heating and cooling systems has been improving. And by the third generation, we see that the temperatures um, for the, the inlet and the outlet temperatures for these systems had reduced substantially. And at the same time, the efficiency uh, had also uh, improved. In terms of the uh, energy resources that could be used to supply these uh, systems, we see that in addition to the fossil fuel based um, uh, sources, we're starting to have um, renewables being introduced such as high temperature geothermal as well as biomass. Now, at the moment we are talking about the fourth generation district heating and cooling systems. These ones are characterized by low um, inlet and outlet temperatures as well as uh, high uh, efficiency. They also ca characterized by the use of uh, heat pumps uh, to boost the temperature, as well as um, um, the, the 
improvement of the energy uh, efficiency of the buildings or improving the, the um, thermal envelope of the buildings. Another important thing to note about the fourth generation um, system is that they also incorporate um, uh, thermal storage. And this is an important component because it, it, can, it now enables the district heating systems to be coupled with other energy systems such as the electric grids. And this leads to the establishment of uh, the, the, the concept that is being developed of uh, smart energy systems, whereby different energy systems can be interconnected. Uh, and of course, you can imagine uh, getting to uh, these uh, fourth uh, generation district heating and cooling systems uh, has its, its fair share of challenges. And uh, recognizing these challenges, uh, IRENA I came together with Alborg University, together with other experts in the district heating and cooling sector, to look at um, some to, to look at ways of addressing the, the challenges that um, that I encountered when it comes to transitioning from the use of fossil fuels to the locally available renewables. And from this process, a guidebook was developed, a guidebook for policymakers that provides the, the tools uh, as well as options for integrating low temperature uh, renewable energy sources in heating and cooling. And in this uh, guidebook, we look, looked at um, some of the challenges and barriers that uh, hinder the integration of uh, uh, renewables in heating and cooling systems as well as the, some possible solutions. The guidebook also looks at the, the various uh, renewable energy options that are available um, in terms of the technologies and, and the sources. It also provides uh, some uh, short case studies um, of uh, successful projects, as well as um, some uh, uh, case studies of options and tools that can be applicable. And uh, now the main uh, part of this, uh, of this guidebook, um, of course, when it comes to the implementation of uh, the heating and cooling system, it looks at, um, uh, uh, for example, in a, in a city that's in ab about to um, start implementing this project. So the guidebook recommends, uh, first of all, doing a scoping of the uh, of heating and cooling. And this scoping should not only take into account the, the heating and cooling sector, but the, the entire energy sector. It also uh, talks about um, the need to identify the various stakeholders who are necessary to make the transition. Another, another um, um, item that the guidebook addresses is mapping of uh, uh, the various renewable, uh, uh, renewable energy sources that are available for providing the heating and cooling, as well as mapping of the heating demand in a given city and also trying to match the heating demand to, uh, with, the, with the energy supply. Of course, the Red Book also looks at how to address the technical challenges, uh, particularly the challenges that are related to uh, compatibility of the energy resources with the networks, as well as the compatibility with the, with the building stock, as, and, and also the inherent um, challenges that, can, that are part of each of the renewable energy resources. Finally, uh, it addresses the regulatory and uh, uh, framework conditions that need to be put in place in order to support the implementation of the uh, renewable-based district heating and cooling systems. And uh, this regulatory um, uh, condition in, in include uh, the establishment of um, a regulatory uh, uh, frameworks as well as a, a regulation of price, pricing it just looks at business models that can support the development of uh, these heating systems. It also addresses issues to do with financing and for resources like geothermal, it looks into risk mitigation facilities that can be able to overcome those challenges. And uh, I'm happy because uh, as part of this uh, uh, event, we are going to be looking at, at uh, the topic of uh, risk mitigation for geothermal resources. So, um, after the completion of the guidebook, uh, then Irina and Alborg University uh, also continued with the collaboration to implement the findings of this report. And this was done through a series of capacity building activities. And I just want to highlight some of the uh, capacity building activities that we did early this year. One of them was held in Belarus in February, where about 85 uh, participants attended. 
And the other one was held in China in March, in which uh, about 200 uh, participants uh, attended. And from these uh, 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 events, what was clear is that um, there's need to start transitioning to the use of renewables uh, and uh, from fossil fuels. And all these countries have sub some substantial renewable energy resources that they can use to make that transition. So uh, thank you. That's uh, the end of the, the introductory part. And uh, now we, we are going to go into the next part uh, where we're going to be listening to the other presenters making their, their uh, presentations. And this part, we're going to focus mainly on geothermal uh, energy resources. Uh, as you know, um, when, when it comes to the development of this, these resources, then we have uh, some quite a number of challenges and um, um, some of them related to the, to the geothermal resource. And this can be addressed through the geothermal risk mitigation uh, uh, schemes. And at this point, I would like to welcome um, Mr. Philip Duma from EJEC to make his presentation uh, based on the GeoRisk uh, project. And um, uh, just to give an introduction of uh, Mr. Duma before he makes his presentation. Uh, so um, he's the Secretary General of EJEC, which is an international association based in Brussels that unites more than 120 companies and organizations representing more than 500 entities from 25 European countries who are working on, on in the geothermal field. He's an author as well as co-author of many publications and also a frequent um, contributor to conferences uh, and workshops and seminars. Uh, he's also uh, active in a number of uh, EU-funded research and market uptake uh, projects that focus on geothermal. So Mr. Duma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you, uh for ARENA and the Global Geothermal Alliance for this cooperation for these events. And so thank you, uh, Gorbis Gonul, also, for allowing us to need share some lessons learned we have on um, geothermal district heating. Um, I will present you. I'm trying to share my screen. It takes one second. Um, indeed, I'm just back from the last meeting we have for, for promoting GeoRisk. Uh, Jacques, I cannot share my screen because you are still sharing your slide. And um, we have a new lessons learned. You know, um, it, it's uh, it's not an ending story when we develop a, a new project ID, uh, a, a new cooperation. Um, we are always uh, some lessons learned, and and we have always further work to do. But what we have tried to to do in, in GeoRisk is to uh, assess all the potential barriers, notably identifying the risk associated with the development of a geothermal district heating project, but not only district heating project, also geothermal electricity project, but here we concentrate on district heating. From this blank page, we wanted to assess what are the most important risks for the development. Um, this uh, project started in 2018 and we are finishing it next Thursday and on the 30th of uh, September. Okay, I think no, we are in full screen mode and I can develop my presentation. So you can see we are a consortium of partners from uh, different countries in Europe, from Turkey, France, Hungary, Poland, Greece, Switzerland, Germany. Us as EJEC, we have the European Geothermal Association, we also try to uh, replicate the best practices and exchange the knowledge from these countries to all the rest of Europe. And because in EJEC, we have members covering 25 European countries from Iceland to Turkey, Portugal to Estonia. You see that also our, our main focus was in Europe with some lessons learned in the main countries I just mentioned. We also wanted to replicate some activities during the project duration, but also beyond the end of the project. And our main focus was Africa, Kenya, South America, Latin America, Mexico and Chile, but also Northern America with Canada, we try to establish some cooperation. And in Europe, we focus on some countries outside our consortium, but the goal is really to replicate all over the world the lessons learned from our project. 
just maybe to start with, we mentioned district heating. We want to have a large approach of district heating when we mention district heating. It's not only to supply heating and cooling to buildings, it can be to industry, to services, to agriculture. In our case, uh, with geothermal, agro food industry is, is a, big, a big sector. Also, we are open in the kind of system that can be developed. It can be small scale to large scale systems. In Europe, we are a lot of resources for, for geothermal. But as mentioned by Jack uh, or by Gerbez also, it's mainly low to medium temperature. So it means that indeed the challenge is not only the resource, the supply of the heating and cooling, is also the demand and how we adapt the building uh, stock today, which is mainly running in, co in countries with high temperature district heating so, or high temperature season. So we have a challenge in how we can match this big potential with the demand. And as mentioned also before, I'm really glad uh, that it's, it's taken as, a, as, as an important milestone. So geothermal can cover 25% of the European population for heating and cooling of buildings with district heating. So it's, it's an important potential. We are far from embracing all this potential. Why? First, because um, we have a good market development, uh, but it's not enough. We have 130. Uh, geothermal uh, electricity plant in Europe. We have two gigawatt thermal, it means more or less 350 district heating. So 350, it starts to be a technology rather major. But you see that it's not the case all over Europe, it's only in some countries. And we have also 2 million geothermal pumps. Why I mentioned that? Because it was mentioned before, low temperature. We have today large geothermal heat pump systems with 1,000 boards it starts to be a smart thermal grid, a kind of district heating. You can see the location of the district heating in Europe with geothermal. It's everywhere. We have 29 countries with such a system, but it's focused today mainly in the Paris area, in Netherlands with greenhouses, and in Bavaria around Munich, without mentioning, of course, all the areas around Hungary. So as I mentioned, to deliver the project, we want to have a geothermal decade. It means, it means that we want to have an exponential growth for the next 10 years. We found that the risking instruments is uh, really necessary. So what we have done in our project in the 36 months, in three years work, we have said, I told you, this topic, uh, me for 20 years, I'm, I'm familiar with this topic. I started with a report in 1997 on establishing a European geothermal risk institution in a risk mitigation schemes. In 2010, we came with a project called Geolake where we did a clear proposal of a European geothermal risk insurance fund. And now we are coming with further proposal with the geo-risk. But also we are quite familiar with such a topic. The market has changed. The, the energy system transition has also imposed new regulations, new market conditions. So we want to really to start with a blank page. We assess all potential risk. We identify them, we assess them, and we provide a tool for the developers, the geo-risk report, where you are able to assess the risk. So one important uh, contribution from GeoRisk is this tool is an online tool where you can identify different categories of risk for the different phase of the development of your project. And with that, you have some further description of the risk and notably how you can tackle the risk. We, in our project, we focus to mitigate the risk only with financial tools. But we know that we have also technological developments to a better identification of the resource, which allow to reduce the risk. Also regulations, and it's a topic we discussed notably yesterday, uh, the exchange of geological data is really important. Uh, we need to have a, a more favorable uh, regulations and framework uh, to allow geothermal developers accessing uh, available data from, from other users of underground. So that is also a contribution to de-risking the system. But here in Jewish, we focus on, on, on financial schemes. So what we have looked at also is what are the existing and innovative financial tools. It exists in many countries. In France, it's 40 years of experience. In Netherlands, more than 20 years of experience. In Germany, some attempts. In, in Turkey, the cooperation with the World Bank and the Turkish Development Bank also has established a scheme. And other parts of the world also have developed some schemes, recently also Flanders in Belgium. So we, are, we have tried to analyze these different schemes. We also look at an important aspect of the framework conditions to have the regulation, the law, the policy 
in place to allow you to establish a de-risking scheme. We look at, and you can see one, one sentence is market maturity. Uh, indeed, it's one of the main contribution of, of de-risk is also the, the going beyond just the technological readiness level, going to the commercial readiness level, the CRI. Um, indeed, we, we, we understand that in a green field where you have not yet explored the reservoir and in brownfield where you have already market maturity, you cannot apply the same scheme. And it's, it's here where we try to, to provide a lot of uh, input on how you have to establish a scheme for the right market conditions and how you can move to maybe in the future public-private partnership or, or, or private insurance uh, scheme where your market is more mature. So I really encourage you to, to look at how, uh, as Georisk, we, we provide some, some, some contribution to, to this topic, but I don't go to the detail um, here. Um, what I mentioned before, we have developed a tool for the developers, and we have also developed a platform for decision makers, for bankers, for financiers, for all people that um, are involved in a risk mitigation scheme. So you have a, a description of uh, key aspects on how to establish a risk mitigation scheme. So I really encourage you also to, to visit the website uh, of Georisk and, and to see in the help desk, you have tutorial, you have uh, videos also explaining the tools and explain also uh, some, some aspect on, on how to establish a scheme. In our project, we, we focus on some countries and, and what we are quite uh, happy is the results we have obtained. So in Hungary, as you know, uh, a risk, uh, in, the risking instrument has been launched by, by the government. So it's one of the success of, of GRIS because we have tried, we contribute, we are not the one, Having instability, but we contribute to the establishment. So we are quite grateful. And again, partners have done a fantastic job. In Poland, we know that uh, the market is a bit less mature. So we are more looking for that as a grant, but it's part of also the risking instrument. And in Greece, we know that things are, are, are moving on. Uh, and Greece is one of the countries pushing for geothermal in the national climate and energy plan. So we hope to see soon also some, some uh, more interesting instrument for, for, for geothermal and especially for heating and cooling, maybe district heating, but also application in, in industry. In France, uh, it's the country, I told you, with quite a, a long experience in, in uh, the risking instruments, and they are now looking for public private partnership, the first of a kind. So let's look at what are the next steps there. In Germany also, they are looking that for France and Germany, one lesson learned is that, of course, resource is important at the right flow rate, the right temperature, but also the surface is important. And you need also to have some instrument for the heating infrastructure. And, uh, and also we look at how, uh, when you have a temperature change, as it's been mentioned, from high temperature to low temperature, how you deal with all the heating system inside the building. So a uh, part of a big renovation wave we need in Europe and probably in the rest of the world, there's uh, so some topics beyond just the risking the resource instruments in the underground. For Switzerland also, the discussion is moving on how to have the right condition for the right market. And in Turkey, the, the scheme was already launched by the World Bank and TKB, the Development Bank, and uh, the second call has been launched. We will uh, learn from, from these calls how to improve the scheme. Uh, one, uh, aspect I, I mentioned new before, it's the framework condition for establishing such a scheme. It's really important. And we are quite happy to see that the European Commission has proposed in an amended renewable energy directive, a measure um, to, for, for, for pushing the creation of risk mitigation frameworks to reduce the cost of capital for renewable IT and cooling projects. So it's typically the instrument we need for geothermal. So we are quite grateful, we hope that uh, the, the, no, the, European, the members of the European Parliament and the different member states will further improve this provision, but it's already in, and it will allow really all countries in the European Union to establish a scheme. But uh, when we, we speak about establishing, scheme, what is important is uh, that indeed we will ask for a public contribution, but asking for a public contribution is not what we want, we don't want just a grant for having a grant. We want to have a grant because it will help us to further develop our sector and contribute to, to climate and energy objectives. So we 
are looking for a sustainable solution. We don't want to have just a three, four years short term system that after is not giving a security for investment in the long term. So we have developed a tool, which is a 10 year simulation tool, which allow to assess first how a scheme is sustainable for 10 years but also how you can have a leverage effect. And it's what we have seen uh, in France and in other countries. If the state is giving 10 million, the fund can be 60 million. So you have a leverage effect of six, which is really important for us. We are, don't want to depend on public budget. We want to have public money for having a leverage to have more private funding. Uh, I don't go to the detail, but I encourage you to really visit the financial model for the 10-year simulation is really, really an interesting tool. And you can see according to uh, different parameters, um, the fee you ask to the uh, developers, the coverage rate you provide to the developer, you have different uh, possibility of having more or less sustainable schemes. So this is a really interesting tool. Uh, we have the idea to further develop this tool in, in the future. So please also provide us any comments you may have on how we can further develop this tool, but it's, it's already available online for you. Last but not least, to, to conclude my, my presentation, we look at also all over Europe and at a global level. So really, uh, we have a lot of materials developed in the Juris Project from the risking uh, geothermal um, project with the uh, risking instruments, focusing mainly on the resource flow rate and temperature, but not only. So if you uh, have any questions, feel free to contact us to engage with the different partners. We are open to, con to continue working with you. Also, the project is ending. We are really here to, to continue to support you. So uh, I, I Closing now my, my presentation, I encourage you really to, to visit the, the website. And um, also, it was, it was a project risk, so with, with, a, with a time limit, we will continue to work in this topic. Uh, one uh, lessons learned we have seen is that, okay, we are focused on the resource, but there's other topics to cover. Notably, we are lacking in Europe, uh, European market for private insurance for the drilling. So for, for, and also for the operation, the, the long-term risk. So we know that there's other topics to cover. Maybe it's, it's a topic for, for the panel, how to create a European, but why not a global market for private insurance? I thank you for your attention and I'm available for any question you may have. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for that um, uh, very uh, nice uh, uh, presentation about the GeoRisk project. I think what really stands out is the fact that you want to develop uh, a project that can be sustainable over the long term, uh, which is, a, which is a, in my opinion, is a very uh, important thing. And uh, I think we are looking, we look forward to the next steps in the implementation of this uh, project, and we hope to see uh, the fruits of it in the near future. So thank you very much. So um, for the next part, I want to introduce our next presenter, uh, Mr. Hans Bolscher. Uh, and he's going to be speaking about energy transition in the Netherlands using geothermal energy. Mr. Boshi is a Dutch economist and a senior policy consultant in the field of climate, environment, uh, and um, energy transition. He's a former director for climate and uh, industry at the Ministry of Environment and former director of CCS at Economic Affairs at the Dutch government. He's deeply involved in economic and social aspects of energy transition with a key focus on heat and underground activities. He's currently the an executive chair of a, of a regional uh, heat company, a director of a heat investment fund, and the chair of the Dutch Geothermal Association. So Mr. Bolche, uh, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, it's coming up. Um, as said, my name is Hans Bolscher, chair of the new association Geo Geothermal in the Netherlands. And thank you for having me all here. Next slide, please. Uh, what I will say, I will give you a very short intro to our association very briefly and then I'm going to speak about district heating in the Netherlands 
and then the role of geothermal within district heating. And at the end, I'll have a look at some uh, challenges and opportunities that uh, we see. Next slide, please. First, our association. It's, the, uh, it's a very young association. We only started in January, but we are a combination of two existing associations. Before, you might have heard of Platform, Geothermal, and DAGO. Next slide, please. Or next click. And uh, we have as new association as a mission to make sure that that is a good promotion of the responsible use of geothermal energy in the Netherlands, but also to defend the collective interest of all the operators and all the stakeholders. So it's, it's really about promoting and we're also defending the interest of all our partners. Next slide, please. Here you can see we have serious companies where it's about 90 members we have. So it's a fast growing association. And this does reflect the fact that there is a lot of hope in the Netherlands on geothermal. I'll come back to that later. Next slide, please. Actually, today, geothermal, geothermal energy in the Netherlands is mainly concentrated on the greenhouses. Click, please. And we have some 22 geothermal uh, doublets in operation at the moment. There are 10 planned in the near future and 35 until 2030. In order for the greenhouse sector to become climate neutral, they, meet, they probably need another 100 wells to be drilled. So there is a lot to be done in that sector and that sector has really taken the lead in the geothermal revolution in the Netherlands. But for this presentation, I will concentrate on the, the built environment and the district heating sector, sector. So this is where it started. This is not where it's going to end in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. In order to understand geothermal in the Netherlands, you have to understand district heating. And you have to realize that we have a very low share of district heating in the Netherlands. Because of all the gas we have everywhere, there's a lot of individual solutions in everywhere. In the cities, on the countryside, everybody has access to gas. It's a legal obligation to have access to gas. And therefore the penetration of uh, individual systems for gas is very, very high. And district heating is relatively underdeveloped in the Netherlands with only four and a half percent of the total heat uh, demand in the uh, housing sector. Click please. But, and that's the good news, we have a lot of plans for the energy transition. We have a, what we call a climate agreement and that stipulates that we will not be using any more gas in 2050. That means that all these gas in the cities has to be replaced. And already by 2030, and that's pretty soon, one and a half million houses have to be without gas. So that is a tremendous transition and a change for uh, the Dutch uh, consumers. And we expect district heating to rise quickly from four and a half percent now to more than 35 percent of the total. So we will see a very big change in the landscape of district heating in the Netherlands and district heating will become much more important according to the plans. This is not without its problems, this is not without its challenges, but this is what the, the, the government and all the scientists and all the companies, this is what they want. This is not automatically what's gonna happen, but that's, I'll come to that when we talk about challenges. Next slide, please. So when we see a lot of, a lot more district heating coming up, we will hopefully also see a lot more geothermal in district heating. But today, again, it's very, very low. We have uh, one project in The Hague, 
producing for 1,500 houses only since January. We have a project in Leeuwarden, the north, where the drilling has just finished. It's potentially maybe good for 10,000 houses, but today there is very little geothermal energy going into the housing sector. But again, the plans are massive. Next slide, please. You see that there is a lot coming uh, in the climate agreement. There's a lot of talk about geothermal energy. 20 to 25% of all the heat for housing is expected to come from geothermal energy. That's 100 petajoules. That means that for the housing sector alone, we expect at least another 500 wells or doublets, so that's a thousand wells to be drilled. So there is a lot of activity expected. Of course, that depends on the alternatives that there is for using carbon neutral heat into district heating. There is more. We are not alone there. There is heat pumps, there is aqua thermal energy, there is biomass, there is solar heat, and of course there is waste heat from industrial plants. So there is there are alternatives and we are competing. But the expectation is that we can deliver 20 to 25 percent of all that heat for the houses uh, in the in the future. Next slide, please. And the question is, are we really going to do this? Is this a lot of paperwork or is it reality? Well, I was talking about 100 plants for the agricultural sector, another 500 for the, for the built environment. Well, actually today we have another 20 projects that are ready to go. Everything has been calculated. They can start drilling almost like tomorrow. So there is a lot of things ready to go. And there has been an agreement with the ministry that these should be operational before 2025. So there's a lot of pressure uh, to make it happen. And we have what we call RES planning, that is renewable energy systems. All the regions in the Netherlands have been asked, how are you going to get rid of the gas? How are you going to become carbon neutral? And many of them said, we need geothermal for that. So there's another 100 projects that should be developed before 2030, according to these planning. So there is a lot going on and there's a lot of planning and preparation. Next slide, please. But it's not going to be easy. First and foremost, it's always about money. Let's not be complicated about that. If there is not a business case, companies will not build it. So at the moment, it's not easy. And I think we should start with ourselves. We as a sector, we have to bring the cost down. We are still pretty expensive. So we have ourselves a lot of homework to do and bring costs down. That will not be enough. We also will need better subsidies, more suitable subsidies that are tailor-made for the geothermal sector because we are a pretty specific sector. So we'll need more subsidies. The alternative, burning fossil is always cheaper. So we cannot think we can do it without subsidies. And maybe the most underestimated problem we have is the, the financial impact of the capacity planning of heat demand. You all know we have the seasonal uh, pattern in heat. You all know we have a daily pattern in heat. And for heat companies, dealing with that uh, capacity planning during the day is, is one of the most important financial parameters in the success of a heat company. And when you deal with geothermal, you have a very stable uh, heat source but you don't want stable. So being able to play with demand and uh, offer of heat is critical in the financial success 
of, um, of geothermal. I'll come to that when we go to the technical challenges. Next click, please. As I said already, pumping cost. It's not only for the cost, it's also for the pumping energy. Our, we take a lot of electricity still. We have to become more energy efficient in geothermal. It will reduce cost. It will reduce our demand for other electricity. So there's really a lot to be gained there. Our drilling and well design has to be so good that society is not having any doubts about risk. At the moment, there are some doubts. At the moment, not all wells are close to perfect. We need to improve the drilling and the well design. We need more innovation in the sector. Well, no sector, geothermal is at the moment pretty old fashioned. We drill a hole, we pump up the water like we did it 30 years ago. We need more innovation. And storage, we have to be aware that and that's where I came back with the capacity planning I just said in the financial. Heat storage is going to be the critical element in making the connection between the demand and geothermal production. Heat storage is the most underestimated challenge in the heat transition. And I'm talking about both low temperature storage and high temperature storage. This, if we can't get storage right, then we have a major problem in the heat transition. And we have to be realistic. There are other alternatives being developed. We are not alone on the market. There is more needed. It's good. We're not a silver bullet. Geothermal should not think of ourselves as the one who's going to save the planet. We are one of the alternatives, and we should be looking at the alternatives and work together with the alternatives. Next click, please. Last but not least, there is, at least in the Netherlands, and I don't know how that's in other countries, but we have problems with uh, societal acceptation of geothermal. It's in the deep underground. People are scared. They connect it to oil and gas. They connect it to earthquakes. They connect it to uh, maybe my house is uh, getting into trouble. Maybe the drinking water is getting into trouble. We have to realize that this social acceptation is key for the future of our sector. We have to explain and to convince that we are safe, that we are clean, and we have to talk to the people. In a very crowded country like the Netherlands, you can do nothing without the full support of local society. And we have to invest in that. And therefore we need better legislation, legislation that is typically suited for geothermal. At the moment, everything that's happening in the underground is more or less linked to oil and gas. We're not oil and gas. We don't take something out, we circulate something. So we need a more specialized legislation and we're working very hard uh, on that with the government at the moment. Next slide, please. There are really nice opportunities in the Netherlands. One of that is that we can combine the built environment with the greenhouses, hybrid solutions, we call that. And then you have the constant demand in the greenhouses and the greenhouses offer, often have already big heat buffers. And if you can combine that, you can create uh, financially uh, better systems. Another opportunity is that we see a fast growing support from government, both financially and in legislation and in planning, the government is really stepping up and uh, we expect geothermal to be uh, uh, embraced more and more by the government. And there are technical opportunities. 
We are looking now at several locations in the Netherlands at the options of horizontal drilling, of closed loop systems. And that's something we should be aware of. We need that innovation. And we see in the typical Dutch underground that there are uh, advantages. And again, one of the bigger advantages is not only in the efficiency, because it's much more expensive, of course, on the CapEx side, but it's much more in the relation to the demand for the heat companies so that they can play with uh, the, the, the cost of the production during the day. And then again, the last point, I can't em emphasize that enough. Uh, geothermal production is not just producing heat. It's about the distribution and the storage and the development of uh, a good distribution system and a good storage system parallel with the geothermal production. Only then we can make a heat transition system that is affordable and reliable. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have a last slide, the last slide. That's my conclusion. My conclusion is that it's very likely that geothermal energy will play a major role in the heating of the built environment in the Netherlands at large scale. And we do foresee double digit growth. So we're small at the moment, but we foresee massive investments and a lot of growth in the near future. Thank you very much. And sorry for my phone ringing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hans, for that uh, a comprehensive presentation about the case of the Netherlands. I think um, Netherlands is quite interesting because it's a country that's uh, transitioning from the use of um, a gas for heating and cooling, and they have chosen geothermal, among other renewables, as their transition source of uh, energy. And I will also note uh, there are quite ambitious plans that you've put in place, um, but it's not just the ambitious plans. Uh, we see that uh, the country is already walking the talk with the uh, projects that are already uh, coming online, as well as uh, working together with the government. So thank you very much. So uh, now we move uh, away from Europe to China, another country that is also doing uh, a lot of uh, great things with the uh, use of geothermal energy for heating and cooling. So this is a country with the largest uh, district heating and cooling network in the world, as well as also some of the largest um, geothermal resources uh, in the world. And uh, to take us through um, a presentation on um, the case of China and the lessons that they have learned in the energy transition using geothermal energy, I'm going to invite um, uh, Mr. Haukur Hardison uh, to take us through that uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Hardison is the founder and chairman of Arctic Green Energy, a leading renewable energy company with main focus on heating and cooling of cities and geothermal uh, energy in particular. He's also the vice chairman of Sinopec Green Energy, the world's largest geothermal district heating company established as a joint venture between Arctic Green uh, Energy and China Sinopec. Mr. Harderson is educated as an architect from the Illinois uh, Institute of Technology in Chicago. So Mr. Harderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Jack. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as, as Jack mentioned, my name is Hoekur Hardason, and I'm the uh, chairman of Arctic Green Energy. I'm going to talk to you about the geothermal tissue heating market in, in China, which is the world's most exciting geothermal tissue heating market today. So Jack, can you move on to the next slide? The leading company in this market, uh, Sinopec Green Energy, uh, our joint venture has about 35% market share. And I'm gonna start by talking about what we have done over the last 15 years uh, with, uh, with Sinopec, our, our partner. It's been a very, very successful um, uh, cooperation. And just to give you a feel for some of the numbers that we have achieved in, in China, we have already connected 60 million square meters of connected uh, capacity. That corresponds to the size of the country of San Marino. We have signed up another 320 million square meters in, in additional projects. That's about the same size as the country of Malta in the Mediterranean. 
We have started to work in over 60 cities and towns across several provinces in China. We have registered over 110 patents. Some are among the most important in the industry, the reinjection uh, patents. And we have drilled today over 750 wells with the average depth of 2.2 kilometers and uh, over 720 heat centrals in operations already. The environmental numbers are also stacking up. This year, we have saved 3.5 million tons of, of CO2 emissions. And that brings our total to over uh, 16 million tons. So let's go to the next slide. When I say that we have started in over 60 cities and towns, this slide shows what we are really doing. We start with cities that are typically suffering from air pollution from, from smog, and we call them suffering cities. And then gradually over some years, we change the um, heat source in the distribution systems from clean to geothermal. So we do it street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, and district by district. And we end up with healthy, clean, living, breathing cities where we are providing our energy at very competitive prices. And actually, we are selling our energy, our geothermal energy in China, under the price of um, the fossil competition, uh, coal and, and, and gas. So our customers, they really get the improved uh, quality of life as a, as a free bonus. And we have never had any direct subsidies in, in this. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the status and the potential of the uh, geothermal district heating sector in, in China. So the, um, the, the, the district heating, uh, the size of the district heating market in China is absolutely the world's largest and fastest growing. Um, the size today has exceeded 150 million square meters, and our joint venture has close to 40% of, of that. But the total size of China's district heating systems is much larger. That has exceeded 21 billion square meters. And most of this is heated with fossil fuels. So there is a huge potential for companies like ours to transition some of these um, existing systems into uh, being served with clean energy sources like uh, geothermal. But not only are, the China, are China's district heating systems very large, but they're also growing at a speed that is probably three times the speed of um, China's urbanization. Today, about 61% of the Chinese population lives in urban areas. By 2050, it'll be over, over 80%. So there is a lot of growth in stock for us. Now, this is all about, has all, all this, what I've told you is about uh, this reheating. Eventually, the district cooling market will be a future expansion market. It is still in its infancy, and there is still, of course, technical problems to be solved. But eventually, uh, the district cooling market may actually exceed the size of the district heating market, geothermal district heating market. Let's go to the next slide. Just going to mention a, a few of the uh, trends in China that I find interesting. First is the market size. The time for geothermal has come in China. It took a long while to long time to to pick up speed, but now it is has is growing at a tremendous and uh, momentum and gaining every year. And it's moving from the sort of ends of the energy spectrum to become an accepted uh, mainstream solution. And another thing I want to point out is code generation. Uh, while we started out as a pure play um, geothermal dish heating company, uh, actually increasing part of our work is to provide code generation or hybrid solutions where geothermal forms the, uh, the backbone being a base load. But this code generation is both between different branches of geothermal, such as uh, hydrothermal and ground source heat pump, direct use and, and, and power generation, 
and also with with other renewables and this is something i see uh, increase going going forward we need to provide total solutions for our customers uh, total green solutions without really caring if it's fully geothermal or if, if there's other clean energies in there uh, technological advances constantly improving technology gives us the opportunity to get more heat energy from less volume and from lower temperatures. Effects to scale will continue to suppress costs, and we all look forward to EGS or hot rock to be uh, commercially viable. Finally, I want to mention two things that I think are quite interesting. One is carbon trading. Carbon trading is, is coming online fast, and our industry will generate a lot of carbon um, uh, tra trading licenses, and it's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out. Another thing I would like to mention is a very exciting technology that has emerged in Iceland in carbon sequestration, a technology that is pumping carbon into the ground using geothermal reinjection wells. Uh, this has been proven to work very, very well. And uh, if we manage to crack this in, in, in China, we will be able to offer a solution that stops escalating the, the, the problem of more uh, pollution simply by changing from the fossil fuel systems to geothermal and then use the uh, geothermal reinjection wells to sequester some of the uh, carbon. So uh, in a way, we'll be, we will help to offer carbon positive solutions. But these are quite exciting uh, um, developments. Next, I want go to the next slide, please. I want to show you two projects that I think are very, very important, not only for the geothermal industry in China, but I think for the geothermal industry around the world. The first project is called Xiongan New Area. This is a new deputy capital of China. It is 100 kilometers southwest of Beijing. And when fully built, it is said to be 2,000 square kilometers, about three and a half size of New York City, just to, for comparison. Uh, we have been working in this uh, futuristic uh, city uh, from the beginning, and this is going to be a global showcase of state-of-the-art use of geothermal. Uh, and uh, we started to, um, to replace the uh, or transition the energy for all the existing population. Then we moved on to the villages around and now we are working full force on the, um, um, on the new construction for the city. And so this city will be a great promoter for the use of geothermal energy. And the other project I think is very important is the Xi'an International Airport. Uh, this is one of the world's largest airport and their new terminal will be over 1 million square meters of floor space and this will all be served with geothermal energy and so th this is a, a made another major showcase for our for our industry and it helps to preach the uh, the message of, of geothermal let's go to the next slide this slide shows really where the fastest growing areas in china are with regards to geothermal uh, tissue heating there are two sort of um, distinctive areas. One is Beijing and the provinces that surround Beijing. This is called the Jingjingji area in, in, in China. And the other area is in Shaanxi, uh, around the uh, old capital of, of, of Xi'an. Both of these areas have a very good geothermal uh, resource for, for, for heating and affluent population or on top that uh, demands uh, decarbonization. So very exciting areas, but we are all in all working in six provinces in China. We typically add a, a new province sort of every, every other year. Let's go to the next slide. So geothermal in China's decarbonization agenda and governmental policies. Clean heating will play a critical role in China's carbon neutrality plan, the much publicized plan where China reaches carbon peak by 2030 
and carbon neutrality by uh, 2060. Within clean heating, geothermal has proven on a massive scale to be the best sustainable and economical solution there is in the market. The Chinese government has, of course, realized and recognized this and is constantly improving and streamlining the policies and regulations uh, to accommodate uh, for, for our industry and what our industry can do for China on its roads to decarbonization. And even this year, there is a number of milestone policies that have been issued. Uh, I list some of them on the slide, such as the Chinese government agenda to 14th fifth year plan. The Chinese National Energy Authority has issued guidance on promoting geothermal. National Administration of Public Affairs has issued a notice to promote geothermal and use in governmental buildings. State Council has issued um, um, a green low carbon circular economy system where geothermal is prominent and so on and so forth. So the, the government is definitely um, assisting geothermal ahead and, and but of course there is this is an ongoing thing to 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 get the regulations on our, our side let's go to the next one i'm going to talk a little bit about challenges and answers uh, us from the geothermal industry are probably facing the same challenges all over the world so i, I i'm not so sure these are only uh, relevant to china the first issue is lack of knowledge of geothermal and uh, Policymakers and planners, they still have a limited knowledge of geothermal. Everybody understands solar and wind energy because you can see it and you can feel it. But this energy that comes from so far under our, our feet, it's sort of people need education about what it can do. And um, we are constantly educating decision makers and policymakers. And we even established a UNESCO um, university level geothermal training program in China in partnership with the National Energy Authority of Iceland. And we have just uh, graduated the um, first 52 students. This is very, very important because capacity training is one of the sort of uh, most important things uh, that we need to look at when as geothermal expands. Now, regulatory and tax challenges, uh, geothermal is not fully appreciated as a renewable energy. Uh, some of the regulations and, and tax, tax structures we have to deal with come from the, uh, you know, the natural mining of natural resources or even water management. So it's not fully clear where geothermal lies and, and to treat us as, as a mining when we re-inject all the water we take out is, is kind of unfair and we, we, are, we are working on that. Um, and then when we are dealing with something myths, myths and, and, and comparator undermining. Geothermal has always been the least understood of the uh, clean energies. And um, there is a, quite a few myths that, um, and superstitions that are around our indus industry, such as uh, low temperature ge geothermal uh, uh, creating earthquakes or, or extracting geothermal brine from two kilometers underground will somehow affect the groundwater or, or freshwater lenses that are two kilometers above. But uh, the best way of uh, uh, answering these challenges, number one is to continue to educate people with science and, and, and facts. But the most important thing we can do is to build showcases that show people what this does and what it can do and how it can trans transform cities and, and, and societies. There is nothing that uh, beats an actual um, project. So um, let's go to the next slide. The future of our industry, in my opinion, is very, very bright. The time for geothermal has come. And if we look to the cities of tomorrow, they will have dual energy systems with uh, multiple renewable energy inputs, highly synchronized. One of these systems will carry electricity and the other one will carry water. And any future renewable energy system will need a baseload backbone. That backbone can only be provided with geothermal. How cities are heated and cooled will lead the march to global, to global decarbonization, carbon neutrality, and ultimately carbon positivity. Thank you.
So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ha Harderson, for that uh, presentation. Um, yeah, we note, uh, first of all, your beautiful dream of um, establishing breathing cities and getting rid of um, suffering cities. And we also note that um, the first rate at which district heating and uh, cooling is growing in China, uh, and we hope that geothermal will be one of the resources that will be able to fill in um, the energy needs of these energy systems. So thank you very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. So um, next, we go to um, the next part of the, of the event where we're going to have a panel discussion uh, whereby the presenters, uh, the speakers for today, uh, we're going to talk more in depth um, based on their presentations. And we'll also be receiving the questions from the audience uh, during this part. Uh, and uh, this uh, part is going to be moderated by Mr. Sanjeev Kumar, the head of policy at EJEC. So uh, just before uh, Mr. Kumar comes uh, online, I would just like us to share a very short video of one minute that is promoting geothermal uh, district heating. Uh, and this is a project that has been done by Irina uh, for a project in um, uh, Serbia in, in Bogatic. So uh, let's just have a look at this. Then after that, we go straight to the panel discussion. I'm sitting in a moment in the town of Bogatic in Western Serbia, heated by geothermal energy and fully covered with clean and green energy. Bogatic is in the center of this Machva region, which actually gave huge geothermal potential. We are trying to promote district heating systems in European countries using geothermal energy. And we have now full support and make Bogatic the first city full independence on fossil fuel. If you spend 150,000 euros per heating season to burn tons of coal and mazut oil, you have now next to zero, few thousand euros per year of total cost. They care that their children breathe clean air no chimneys, no pollution, no fog anymore. On the basis of this experience, we have now a number of municipalities that are interested to do the similar thing. Everybody is trying to use geothermal because it's locally available and it's reliable on a long-term basis. Jack, you're mute. Um, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Kumar. Now uh, you can please uh, proceed with the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Jack. And uh, thank you to our uh, wonderful speakers today. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we've got about uh, 20 minutes worth of uh, conversation time. So we're gonna go a little bit um, over the, the allotted hour, but I think there's a lot of rich information that we've learned today. And it's important to get a chance to explore um, uh, some of the questions and that were raised by the speakers, but also raised by uh, the the, um, the audience. So maybe maybe we can go to an audience question first, because I've seen I, I've noticed there's a, there's a little bit of traffic around this one, um, and that's really to this whole issue of hydrogen for heating. Um, and maybe if I can ask uh, Hans um, and maybe Hakar as well, if they if they um, are, are if he's open to responding to this one, but can you give us a flavour of what that actually means in the context of you know China and the Netherlands and um, how viable an option is this? If I may uh, give it a first go, uh, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen at the moment. It's one of those uh, nice uh, things for the future. And I'm absolutely positive about hydrogen, but uh, it has its limitations. And for heating of the housing sector, it's very unlikely that hydrogen will be the first choice. 
it's much more likely that you're, uh, if you're going to make hydrogen, which is pretty energy uh, intensive to make, and, and if you're going to make it, you're going to use it where it has its most added value, and that it's most likely in the high temperature uses in industry. That's where I see most of the hydrogen going, maybe a little bit in some hard to decarbonize transport elements, not in the, in, the, in the small cars, but maybe in the trucks or in the trains or in the ships. But uh, I don't see it in the housing sector. It's just not the way to go. And I think most of the studies prove it and political is very, uh, people like it. It's like, oh, this is the new solution for everything, but it's super expensive and it's not very practical. So I don't see that in the housing sector. Brilliant, thank you. Hauke, would you like to add to that? Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think uh, Hans got it uh, perfectly. And I also want to mention that, you know, when we are talking about geothermal or heating houses, we are talking about a clean energy Green hydrogen is, is not really common these days. Green hydrogen is a tiny little fraction of the hydrogen industry. So yeah, hydrogen is definitely something of interest in, in the future, but as a means to heat up cities and, and buildings, that I don't think so. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, that was a very clear responses. Um, something that um, all three of you uh, touched upon was um, this notion of kind of technological innovation um, and, and kind of cost reduction for geothermal plants in one way or another. Um, so I'm quite keen to see, I mean, Philippe talked about the, the regulatory approach, the, the, the risk management. Uh, Hans, you talked about, you know, the need to kind of bring down the, the cost and some of the electricity consumption. And uh, Haka, you also mentioned cooling as well, which is the, the, the only one of our, our panel members to, to talk about that really important subject, which uh, often gets left behind. So I'm curious if we can kind of pull those those kind of topics together. What do you, where do you see the big innovation um, uh, 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 kind of uh, rewards coming for geothermal of the next uh, decade? Let's let's think of like the you know to 2030, maybe to 2040. I mean, is horizontal drilling going to be a game changer? Is you know, developing the, the cooling market's going to be a game changer in terms of rebalancing the costs and the, the, the economic benefits of the geothermal. Maybe maybe I can go to you first, Hauke. Um. Well, uh, uh, the future is always hard to predict, but um, uh, let's try. If you look far enough into the future, we will have hot rock or EGS um, enhanced geothermal system, and those will be absolutely fantastic. But they are still not commercially viable. But what I think will happen is that the hydrothermal, the way we do hydrothermal, where you have a, a production well and a reinjection well, and, and you sort of, that will simply just sort of grow into, I think, ETS. I'm not so sure with uh, about this closed loop, loop system that use you know, some, uh, some, some fluid in, in between. But I definitely think long-term EGS is something very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, we have, of course, in a drill, on a drilling side, we have a lot to learn from the uh, fossil fuel industry. I mean, that's where we get our, um, our advances in, 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 in drilling. And uh, I can name one such problem. Uh, as you may know, Iceland has drilled uh, some of the world's first supercritical wells, where they drilled into uh, really molten magma. And uh, but the drill bits that they melt when they hit the uh, magma. So yeah, but speaking of drilling, maybe one of the uh, biggest uh, sort of technical hindrances in Europe, because we already also work in Europe, not only in China, is actually the prohibitive drilling costs when you are simply drilling for low temperature geo geothermal. This is something that has been sold in China, the average cost per well there is maybe $400,000 uh, when you're drilling into sandstone. And uh, you come to Europe and it's like uh, six, seven, eight million dollars. So there is definitely room for improvement there. Thank you. Um, Hans, would you like to, to build on that, please? Yeah, well, as, as Hakra said, it's difficult to predict the future. I'm a little bit more op optimistic about the closed loop, not because of the technical side of the drilling and the piping, but more of the options it gives in controlling the heat flows for heat companies. In the end, 
the bill is be is paid by consumers, and the consumers want the heat at a very certain a specific moment of the day. And that demand will drive the geothermal sector. So um, the combination of uh, storage, flexibility, closed loop, I think that's where the big game changer has to come from. And yes, we have to bring drilling costs massively down in Europe. And when I hear that figure, it's completely out of the range that we use here. So indeed, uh, and uh, there is uh, clearly a room for improvement there. There is also um, cooling will in the Netherlands not be the first topic, but it's increasing. We can see that uh, the cooling demand, uh, as I said, I'm also the chair of a, of a heat company and we, can, we are using more and more our heat for cooling demands in the summer. So that's an increasing market, but still a relatively limited market in the Netherlands, but in the South of Europe, it's a fast growing and it's, it's going to be a massive part of the, of the energy bill is going to, going to cooling. So there also, this could be more relevant and not every part of, the, of Europe has the same good underground. The underground and the temperatures in the Netherlands are not great. We talk really about 90, 100, sometimes 100. 110 degrees Celsius that we bring up. Uh, of course, in, in Iceland, that's so much better. And apparently in China as well. So that has a big impact on the overall cost of geothermal, of course. And, and Philippe, would you like to jump in? Yeah, so I will distinguish the price and the cost. Uh, the cost of a, of a project today, indeed, we can do some research innovation. We have a European platform for that in Europe where all stakeholders are working on that. For the drilling, we have a drilling design we are improving. In Paris, uh, they are looking at sub-oriental wells. We are looking also to that in, in, in Germany. There's room for improvement. I think the best improvement we can have in the cost is indeed learning from oil and gas, the project management. It's because, of course, we know 3D seismic also for exploration, we can reduce the cost, we can have better prediction of the resource, but it's more on the product management. Cost can be reduced. But just look at the cost today in mature markets. In Paris, a geothermal dish heating system is already three times cheaper than a gas boiler. So we are quite competitive in mature markets. Uh, we have room for improvement, so we can be even more competitive. But what is missing is more on the price competition because we have an unfair competition. With gas, there's no carbon pricing for it increasing nearly all over Europe. And still, you have some subsidies for fossil fuel in the majority of the country. So I will distinguish with the cost where we can do some research development to decrease the cost, but the price in the market condition is unfair. Yeah. What you mentioned about drilling, it's a topic I'm, I'm working for many years. Indeed, we are lacking a European market for drilling. And there's, lack of, there's not enough competition, there's not enough fluidity in the market where a rig can move from one country to one country. It's also due to regulation. And you know that once in, in, in Netherlands, you had a review of, of, of a different guidelines for the well design, et cetera, for the drilling. And all that is a bit disturbing the market competition because each country has different uh, rules, notably the, the number that, uh, that the drillers can work um, with different cycles, per, it's different, it's social. Uh, rules which are different country by country. So we need also to work on that road to have a fluidity in a European market, but also at a global level on market. We have to be quite frank and, and honest also with, with, with the customer. Uh, they cannot expect a dramatic reduction of their eating and cooling price in the future. We will provide stability, we will provide sustainability, we will provide uh, climate objectives, with, with low emissions, it will not be dramatically uh, less than what they pay today. It's just that they will, it will be for more sustainability and, and that. But we are quite sure that we can provide nearly the same cost that they pay today. Affordability of our technologies is, is, is quite certain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just, want to, I just want to build on this one and kind of focus a little bit on the risk mitigation frameworks because we've got three different vantage points. So, um, uh, you know, you have kind of political, much more political awareness in China, in the Netherlands, um, and across different parts of, of Europe. Um, even the US is talking a lot about geothermal. So, so it's definitely becoming, you know, moving up the radar. 
Um, but there's a difference between kind of getting the, the political push and actually the right kind of financial risk management. So, you know, the, the difference in cost for drilling, say, for example, in China compared to some European projects. Do you think that that's down to the different ways in which financial risk is treated by the different countries? And, and is there maybe somewhere an area for ARENA to look at kind of, um, you know, a, a, a global or a, or a multinational um, a risk for, uh, financing framework? Maybe, maybe Philippe, you can start with that and then be interested to see. Yeah, yeah so, so we know that it's, uh, it, it's existing and it's working the risking instrument. We have a lot of lessons learned, uh, but what is crucial is really to replicate that according to the market condition and the market maturity. We know that in a green field, where it's the, right, the, the risk is high, you cannot have the same conditions when you have a brown field, where you have like in Paris or in Munich, where you drill and you're quite certain about the resource. So you need really to, to take that into account. Um, what I will look at in, in, in the risking is also probably the business model, uh, because we speak a lot about the resource, but we have to look at the demand side. So what, who is the profile of a customer? Uh, you need to have certainty uh, because the risk, we can manage the risk of underground, but the risk of a demand to be sure you have a customer on 20 years. We, we, we are launching this initiative of heat purchase agreement now to have large customer. It's why combining with, uh, with industry, with services, with agro to have multi kind of, of large customer can also improve the risk of your business model. Because the issue is that the resource risk after, I don't want that is uh, making people afraid of developing a geothermal. We know what to do it. It's not a problem of how to do it. The problem is how you manage your business model and you have certainty to sell on the long term you're eating. Yeah. If I can add to that, uh, Philip, because indeed uh, the risk of the demand side is in the Netherlands at least probably the, the, the most complicated one uh, to, to take into your business case, to, to calculate Everybody is saying, oh, maybe we'll develop uh, a 50% increase in demand over the, over the next five years. Or, but if that's seven years or eight years, already your whole business case is down the drain. So the demand side risk is, is massive. And I also want to say, in the end, uh, financial parties are not afraid of risk. That's always a, a myth that people, uh, that you can't uh, invest if there is risk involved. No, risk, I'm in there, I'm an economist. Risk is only attractive when there is enough return. And when you have a very low return combined with a high risk, then you can't get your finance. So it's a combination of getting a decent return and not too high risk. And it's always in that combination. So de-risking is always one-on-one -on -one linked to the potential uh, a return that is in the business case. So that's, I think, a very important concept to realize. When they start drilling for oil, sometimes they take huge risks and they get it financed easily. But if they hit it, if they hit it right, the returns are excessive. We don't have the excessive returns, but we do have the high risk. And that's where our complication uh, comes in. Uh, Holker, would you like to add to? No, I, I think uh, there were a number of interesting points uh, that were touched on in 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 terms of uh, risk, because another one uh, let's uh, that has been made the industry quite attractive in China is really the uh, business model, and this is something I think that Europe is sort of lacking because I don't think Europe has properly priced in sort of clean heat. You know, everybody's looking at clean electricity. But uh, the pricing for, for or a business model for clean heat in Europe is it's much less attractive than it, um, it should be. Uh, one of the things we have in China is, is um, while the uh, maybe the profitability is not very high uh, per, per user, but the, the business plan is, is is quite nice because we we get a large part of our capex uh, paid up front by the authorities as as a connection fee. And then the authorities collect that amount from, from, the, from the user. So this actually has helped us to expand uh, quite fast. But Hans, you, you are absolutely right. Uh, risk is really about you, you match it against the reward that you're getting. And um, uh, 
we have grown very, very fast as a company, and it has not been a, a, a problem uh, to get some of the leading uh, investors around the world into our ventures, because we, we can show that uh, the rewards match the risk profile. Yeah. If, if, if I may add to that, huh? um, I was pretty impressed by your presentation, Harker, and the figures. And I was thinking by myself, what's the big difference? And I think one of the big differences is that, uh, that in, in the Netherlands, we are not having a very massive uh, new building of, of houses and cities. Yes. You know, we're all working in the existing cities and we don't have district heating. Yes. When you, when you develop it from the start on, it's so much easier. It like is. in Denmark, you know, they have dent heating systems everywhere. So that if you have to go afterwards to a household and say, sorry, now you don't have your nice gas uh, heating anymore. We're going to come with district heating. People don't like it. When you do it from the beginning, it's so much better. So you have a really good advantage there and please use it to the max. <laughs> yes, but also I want to remind you that Iceland, I think Iceland is still the only country in the world that is 100% has space heating with, with, with geothermal. And that was actually done by digging up all the streets, street by street. But when people understood the alternative was continued air pollution, massive air pollution, you know, you come to Reykjavik today and you find that the air quality is among the, the best in the world. But 60 years ago, Reykjavik was just as polluted as the cities of Northern Asia. Northern Asia. So um, people accepted this to, to do it like this. It is more complicated to do the retrofits, but I think it has to be done. Mm. Look, this is this is this is fascinating. I I I just, I just want to jump on the point that, that you made about China. I mean, look, we've seen how China's kind of entry into you know wind and solar radically transformed the wind and solar industries today. Yes. Um, we've seen how their entry into the electric uh, vehicles and batteries has just transformed those sectors. So clearly, China is now looking at geothermal, um, and they're looking at geothermal district heating. Do you think that some of the, the cost reductions, the know-how, the operational management and the political will is going to be radically changed by China's entry into geothermal over the next decade? Is this, is this really the, the, the point at which the industry becomes uh, a big player? I really think so. I think we are already well into that momentum of geothermal becoming a, a mainstream solution in China. China China set these very, very ambitious uh, decarbonization plans, as have many, many other countries. But they realized that in order to, to, to get to those goals, they have to do something. And if you look at where the pollution is coming from, uh, so much of it is coming from the, uh, for the simple task of creating heat. So the geothermal is sort of, a, in a way, uh, it, it kind of can save the day. Because if you, they don't address how cities are heated and cooled, they can say goodbye to this, uh, these goals. And so, yes, uh, and I do think that, let's say, a more cooperative effort between China and, and Europe can work uh, both ways. For example, I think the, um, the, the heating system is quite different in, in China. We can use very, very low temperatures in China and, and still provide the heat. So I think that is something we can share with Europe. Europe is typically working on input temperatures or 80 or 90 degrees. And uh, we can go down to you know 55 in 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 China, and that vastly uh, increases increases the efficiency and the areas uh, that we can serve. So I think there is a lot of knowledge that can be shared both ways. As we start with, between Iceland and, and and China, coming from Iceland, we started to teach them how we did things, and now we can actually teach the Icelanders a thing or two back from 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 China. And I think the same thing can happen with Europe, and I really hope that. Uh, something like this will happen because the more people, the more alliances we get into promoting geothermal, the, the, the more chances we have of, of, of success. Our industry has always suffered from that. All the lobbyists, they are behind solar and wind. You know, there are not many of us who are talking for geothermal, but slowly but surely we'll get them. We're getting there. <laughs> but as, as Hans was mentioning, we are, we are the start of a, of, a, of a bright story, but we are the start and 
when you mentioned China, I think it's the same problem. We need to build an industrial strategy. We need to do that properly. You, you mentioned ants in the Netherlands, you have great ambitions, but we need to be sure the rigs will be available, the workforce will be there, the engineers will be there, all the equipment will be there. So we need to be just we know the potential is huge. When we mentioned 25% of the urban population can have geothermal, so we have a big potential. We are just at the start of a nice story. The industry, the geothermal industry sector is not yet mature. We need really to build that all together to have a strategy for the next 10 years to be sure we have a facility everywhere and knowledge sharing will be crucial with China, with USA, with the rest of the world. And it's why Arena probably as you are A also today with us, it's maybe one 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 thing which we can give you. Please help us to 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 better share the knowledge for building this this nice strategy for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask uh, Hoker a question? Because he, he said something very intriguing just before about temperature. Huh? Here in the Netherlands in general, we have the ID, and maybe he has better and other information that when the houses are very well insulated, so when you can do it with low temperature, then yeah. you can also go pretty easily for individual heat pumps. So the, in the new areas of the Netherlands, often people choose for, uh, for individual heat pumps and not for collective systems. Yeah. And we say, well, let's reserve geothermal for, for mid and higher temperature for those buildings that we cannot insulate that perfectly. So not for the new build, but you are using low temperature geothermal for new build. And that is competitive with electric heat pumps. Is that correct? Yes, and you see, the heat pumps is also about scale if you are thinking about small scale solutions let's call it a single house single building or something like like that yes the the heat pumps they i mean they're, they're i mean we use quite a lot of heat pumps in in, in our work but when you go to pro, uh, doing a proper district heating uh, solution you know you maybe have a well that is serving 100,000 square meters so the efficiency the financial sort of efficiency um, becomes much more interesting when you do district heating with, from, from, from a well that is serving a large area. But if you are thinking house by house, you know, then the heat pumps are always getting more interesting and they are gaining in efficiency every year. And now we are seeing industrial size heat pumps and we think that's great. But there is a sort of a, a matter of scale where the uh, big solutions start to take over. How do you serve a whole neighborhood? You can do that from a single well, but that's going to be an awful lot of heat pumps. Yeah, <laughs> very, very well said. Um, look, I'm going to come to the last question now because I'm conscious of the time. Um, and it's, it's something we've all talked about and to which there is no answer, but a lot of learning. Um, and that's around the kind of the, the societal public acceptability of GSL. We, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the, the political awareness is happening now, the, the regulatory frameworks are slowly starting to develop around geothermal. Still a long way that we need to go around on, but we still have, you know, in some cases issues around public acceptability and, you know, societal engagement. So I'm just curious as to um, uh, your thoughts on how we can um, uh, address this as a, you know, as a global community, because it doesn't matter, you know, who we compete with, we are all in this space and we're all going to face this issue at some stage another so maybe um uh, whoever would like to go first um how would you how do you think we should go about addressing this uh, so what we what we try to to do uh, as ejec and, and in europe is to first have a right figure and what is the environmental impact it's really important to have a transparency and what is the impact don't mix the risk the incident and the impact what is potential and what is what is uh, really happening and that we need also to consider the socioeconomic impact. So what is brilliant with geothermal is that we have a lot of impact and positive impact in local economic development uh, for on, on creating jobs and providing a local economic development. And that today is not enough highlighted and rewarded, um, I, I think. So we are an industrial development. So of course we have an impact uh, being a, a facility on the ground. Uh, what is probably missing in geothermal compared to other sectors is communication. We need to do much more communication 
And we need also to have a reward on the local economic development we are providing. And I see this is two angle where we are start uh, just at the start of, of a thinking how we can make that. We have seen like, for example, some crowdfunding system have, have worked for the link project. So beyond public acceptance, public engagement is also a topic to, for the future. But we are, we are seeing that in, in countries in areas where you have a lot of gentlemen like in Tuscany, it's really becoming a, a nice story or in Iceland where you create an economy around that providing products, tourism, et cetera, et cetera. So we need really to think how we can reward that. Yeah, I want to echo that because that uh, we can lose it very easily as an industry. It's very easily lost. And uh, there is in the, in the chat, there is a comment from, I think, uh, Professor Laroche. And uh, it's, it's indeed, you know, just a few bad examples can kill it for the whole industry. With social media, uh, a bad example from China will be picked up in the Netherlands immediately. You know, that's the way things go nowadays. And uh, yes. there is a lot of fear out there. And there is a lot of unreasonable fear sometimes. But uh, we have to make sure that our communication, that this is really a part of the solution, is really on par with other communications. And so far, we are not. Uh, in the Netherlands, we do have some sympathy, but I've worked in the biomass uh, industry and five years ago we were uh, hot and positive and today uh, we are considered very negative and very bad. So you can lose public sympathy within a matter of years if you don't have your communication in order, if you're not prepared to, uh, to face it. And if there are incidents, we all have to avoid incidents. Incidents are, in this era of social media, any incident is, is, is killing. And that's something we have to realize. In, in, indeed, uh, it, this is, uh, I think this is a sort of twofold thing. We have to continue to educate uh, people about what geothermal is and, and help them to sort of uh, push out the superstitions about it. And, but also, there is really nothing that beats reality. The reality will always beat theories. So we need to build showcases where we can show people on their own soil how this works. So they don't have to read about what I'm doing in China or, or, or somebody else is doing somewhere else. So building these showcases is very, very important. And also for people just to understand what geothermal is. Everybody understands the sun and we can get energy from there. But the surface of the sun is the same temperature as the core of the earth. And the core of the earth is only 3,500 kilometers away from us. The surface of the sun is 150 million kilometers away. And people just have to understand that what we are doing, we are simply capturing some of this energy that is constantly escaping the core. And we are just passing it through our technical geothermal system on its way out to space. So we need to educate people and build showcases. And we are. Brilliant. Oh, I, I, that's, that's fascinating. Look, um, uh, it's, it's a shame, really, because I would love to carry this conversation on for the rest of the day, but I, I'm, I'm afraid we've gone uh, quite a lot over time. Um, I'd like to thank you all for a fabulous uh, uh, discussion. There's so much more comments coming in now. I think everybody's <laughs> everybody's kind of, their brains are now working and the machine is kicking in. Um, our contact, everybody's contact details, I believe, is going to be made available okay. um, uh, by um, Irina, so the conversations can carry on. And I look forward to meeting you all one day in person so that we can, we can carry on in a much more relaxed environment. Um, and on that note, I'll hand back to Jack and uh, we can wrap up. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kumar, for that uh, excellent uh, moderated session. And thank you to all the panelists for the uh, very good discussion. So uh, it's very clear uh, from this discussion that there's a lot of potential for geothermal to continue playing a big role in the energy transition, particularly in the heating sector. And I would urge all the stakeholders involved in geothermal, both from the public and the private sector, from academia, as well as uh, financial and other development institutions to continue championing for geothermal energy. So um, at this point, I think uh, it's now time to call it a day, but I would really urge um, um, 
for only four minutes of your time to watch one more clip about a, a Jiram project, a Jiram district heating project that um, has already been mentioned by um, Haukur, the uh, Shungan new area uh, project, um, whereby um, the residents are talking about some of the benefits that they, they see from this project. So um, it's only four minutes and I'm going to share it right now. We are Yangchisha 也是有一定的改善。通过我的工作呢，让这个换热带变得更加自动化、智能化。从这个开采井把地热水我们抽取上来之后呢，通过我们的这个反式换热器，然后进行热量的这个储存和这个呃交换。呃，剩下剩下的
to make his opening and his closing remarks and officially close the event. Mr. Abdullah, welcome. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I know we have come to the end of very open and candid discussions on geothermal district heating and cooling this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. Of course, the, during this event, the call, the event is co-organized by IRENA and the European Geothermal Energy Council, EJEC, in the framework of the International Conference on Smart Energy Systems and under the umbrella of the Global Geothermal Alliance. Obviously, as you may know, the scientific community has um, repeatedly reiterated and recommended that the greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced by at least 45% by 2030 in comparison to 2010, and net zero by the second half of the century, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. However, the synthesis report of the NDC uh, that has been prepared by UNFCCC based on the latest NDC submissions projected that the carbon emissions by 2030 will instant be raised by 16% higher than 2010 levels, which is quite alarming. So therefore the governments and businesses must act now to raise their climate ambitions to avoid a catastrophic and irreversible damage to the climate and the humanity in general. The heating and cooling sector is a major consumer of energy, as you may know, most of which is currently supplied from fossil fuel. One of the pathways to achieving the global climate agenda is obviously through the implementation of fossils, fossil fuels switch in the heating and cooling sector. Geothermal energy is proven technology which can readily be substituted with the use of fossil fuels. Indeed, from today's presentations, it, had, it has been obvious that the geothermal has enormous potential to decarbonize the sector, energy sector, and the systems in the cities has been witnessed in the Netherlands and China. The geothermal energy potential, in particular from the low and medium temperature resources, is significant, yet remains largely untapped. The resource is right under our feet, meaning that we can use it to meet our daily needs of the energy. However, the challenges are still quite enormous related to its development, such as resource risk, high investment costs, limited capacity, and another enabling framework greatly hinders the utilization as been eluded by the panel members and the presentations. Nonetheless, the stakeholders are working tirelessly to find solutions to these challenges, and we applaud their contribution and continuous efforts to these endeavors. The recommendations from the Georisk project coordinated by EJEC, which were presented here today, will largely address the resource risk associated with the geothermal exploration. I urge governments, industry, business players to collaborate in ensuring the full implementation of the recommendations. This will contribute to the enhancement and improvement of the geothermal sector's contribution to energy transition and climate action. In addition, the development of district heating and cooling systems in cities would go a long way in facilitating the increased utilization of the high shares of geothermal in the building sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the experiences and recommendations shared here today will propel geothermal energy to contribute more significantly to the ongoing energy transition and climate change. I would like to conclude by extending my deepest gratitude to all the speakers and panelists for sharing your wealth of knowledge, experiences, and best practices. I also wanted to extend my appreciation to our partners, EJEC and Alberg University for supporting the arena in undertaking this event. And many thanks to all the Global Geothermal Alliance team for working tirelessly behind the scene to coordinate the delivery of this important event. And to you, participants 
and constructive engagement is much appreciated. With that, I now close the event and look forward to continuously collaborating with you to enhance the growth of geothermal energy in supply and district heating and cooling systems. I thank you very much.